So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, uh, the future of Unitarian Universalism, which seems only fitting given that BB is the future of Unitarian Universalism. Also, last week uh, was District Assembly, which uh, it was not stated, but it was certainly orienting us to consider the future of Unitarian Universalism. And the theme of District Assembly last week was interdependence. And this is not only because it's in our principles, it's the last principle, the inherent web, the uh, interdependent web of life. Um, but as it turns out, it's also possibly the only way that we're going to survive is by living into our interdependence. Now, in our principles, interdependence is not a prescription. It's an observation. We observe that existence is interdependent. The prescription is that we respect it. The observation is almost an assumption to the, to the instruction. So our respect for the interdependent web of life, even as an instruction, isn't necessarily a plan having to do anything uh, with institutional health or the survival of our tradition. Democracy is in our principles also. That is a bit more of an institutional plan. Respect for the interdependent web of existence isn't quite an institutional plan, but we are finding that our future must include an institutional structure that is interdependent. So perhaps this is coincidence, or perhaps this is nature replicating its most effective structures that our institutions must become reflections of reality as we observe it. Whatever it is, we are beginning to not only see the beauty and, and, and the implications of the interconnected web, but we are now beginning to see its wisdom. So underlying the district assembly theme of institutional interdependence is the recognition that our current situation is not sustainable. So feel free to extrapolate that to all of civilization if you want to, but uh, particularly for Unitarian Universalism, um, there's some concern now uh, that, uh, that our future is not assured. Now this concern is more prevalent in the East than it is out here in the West. Of course, our headquarters are in the East, so we get a lot of thinking about this going on back there, but um, you know, in New England, they are seeing evidently uh, a drop in membership uh, that is lagging behind, uh, but, but the, the mainstream uh, reform traditions mainstream Protestant traditions have seen a huge drop, and now we're starting to uh, see a little bit of a drop back east. Out west, we're kind of still high in the hog a little bit. Our congregations are doing generally pretty well. But again, is that a trend? Is that a wave that's going to, to roll across the continent and affect us? So, in light of that concern, Scott Taylor, the UUA Director of Congregational Life, uh, gave the keynote address at uh, District Assembly, and the keynote was about institutional interdependence. And he has identified what he calls the seven horses of the apocalypse, because <laughs> UUs are overachievers. <laughs> and they are, and this is about institutional stuff, right, okay? Uh, rising health care costs, rising energy costs and building maintenance, decreasing giving patterns, not a problem for this congregation, but a problem for some. The rise of the nuns. Now, you know I'm not talking about Catholic nuns. <laughs> We're talking about the people who check the box that says none under the category of religion. So the rise of the nuns. And this is really interesting to me, the loss of our bread and butter buffer. Um, 
So basically, we were not losing members as a denomination for the last 50 years because people were fleeing the denominations that were and coming here. Well, that pool is all dried up. They're all already here. I should say, you're all already here. <laughs> so that pool is no longer drying, uh, supplying us. And we, that, that source of, of membership and energy is on its way to being gone. So we don't have that pool uh, to build on anymore. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, and then he also says another one of the horses is the covenantal UU fair share, which we at this congregation happily contribute to, and fair staff compensation costs. I, I'm evidently a horse of the apocalypse. That's <laughs> never really thought about it that way. Um, so what this results in is not enough capacity and an inability to staff for growth. We don't have the ability to hire enough staff to maintain the buildings in order for this congregation and our denominate our whoops our association to grow. He then proposed a solution. The solution was to identify redundancies. <laughs> It's just funny to hear the word redundancies in a sermon, right? I mean, it's like redundancy, and in my mind, it's like a kill switch. It's like redundancy, I'm like, oh, that's boring. <laughs> but identify redundancies and disconnection by sharing and combining resources with other congregations to create economies of scale, all right? So we are being encouraged to share resources with our fellow nearby congregations. So some ways that he proposed to do this, some of these are not for us because they work well in a situation where you've got three Unitarian Universalist churches in 10 minutes of each other. We don't have that. Uh, you know, we have it in a half an hour and 45 minutes and an hour and a half, right? But it's still, some of these are still possible for us. So one of them is theme sharing and related resources related to that theme, sharing those. So we're on our way to doing this. As a matter of fact, tomorrow you will all be getting an email uh, that is a survey about themes that the Baja Four, that's the four Southeastern Arizona congregations are working to put together so that next year, with your input and their input and their input and their input, we will all be on the same monthly themes. Now that will allow us to, if our RE can then be on that theme and their RE is on that theme, now they can share resources. I can share resources with Diane and Matthew and whoever winds up at Sky Island. We can share sermon resources. We could do pulpit swaps, we're all on the same theme, so you'll be hearing thoughts about the same thing. So this is a way to, to um, share resources. Another one is small group sharing circles. Youth and youth group sharing, that's something that we might think about. Regional uh, community minister and social justice minister sharing. We're sort of doing this with UU Jazz. Um, it's not quite explicitly, I think, uh, community minister sharing, but it's, it's close to that. Then administrative and staff services sharing. Boards covenanting to think regionally and develop regional strategic plans. And this is, we're, again, we're ahead of the curve here because we've got the Baja Four. Uh, Betty and, are you serving on the Baja Four? BB serving on the Baja Four. We didn't even list that in the <laughs> litany of things that BB does. So these are uh, lay leaders who've gotten together from all four congregations to share resources. Um, that's very exciting. Um, and then boards covenanting to be clearinghouses. I don't even know what that means. Uh, congregations considering sharing endowments. <laughs> Do we have any representatives of 22nd Street here today? Uh, so joint outreach to nun, uh, to the nuns, and uh, parish minister and RE staff sharing. So what that would look like, for instance, let's say we've got, right now, we've got, uh, let's say, two RE professionals 
Right now they have to prepare four lesson plans a month, right? Well, if they got together, they would only have to prepare two lesson plans a month. They would still have to teach four lessons, but the prep time would decrease, and that would allow them to serve other functions. I mean, I could envision something where we have a DRE uh, at halftime at some point, and they're sharing, we're sharing with uh, uh, 22nd Street Church, and uh, because we're share, uh, sharing resources, she's got or he's got some extra time and perhaps becomes a volunteer coordinator, a membership coordinator, something like that. So what we're doing is having the same level of staffing, the same level of funding and more programming and more impact. We're increasing our capacity and efficiency and we're decreasing the loneliness and the isolation. There's no reason that our staff needs to be isolated from other staff. There's wisdom in that conversation. And there's collegiality in that uh, conversation. So, and those are two very important things. So hooray, we've got, we've got sort of a plan. We've got, uh, we're gonna live into our interdependence. And we're gonna find more capacity and efficiency, but, but here's the thing. Uh, capacity is necessary, but specifically regarding the nuns, do we have what they're looking for? We had what you were looking for when you came from Methodism or, or Judaism or uh, Catholicism, when you came here from those traditions, seeking a tradition but not a dogma, that we had. We could sell freedom from dogma, but the nuns have freedom <laughs> from dogma. It's like selling, you know, water to the ocean. <laughs> so we have to start asking ourselves a question, a deep question, what are we? Because we're more than just the sense of freedom. We're more than freedom from dogma. And you heard it in Bibiana's Credo. She likes the freedom from dogma and yet craves something a little bit more positive. So the emphasis, it's an emphasis on theological freedom catered to some of the, catered to the come outers and the individualist attitudes of the so-called greatest generation, boomers, and then some Gen Xers. But it was sort of a via negativa. <coughs> My intuition says this is not the message that the, some of the Xers and the millennials, in other words, this is not the message that the, is going to resonate with the future. They don't need our freedom. But humans will always have a religious need. They'll always have an ethical need and a need for formative community and making meaning through ritual, symbols, myth, history, practice, and philosophy. That's not going away. We have those things. And as it turns out, freedom is only part of our message. It was a part that has been emphasized for a few generations, but it is only a fraction of what we are. And if we are to be anything in the future, we need to figure out what the other fractions of the whole are and start emphasizing them. This will be good for us, for those of us who are already here. This will be good for us, and it will also be good for our tradition. So perhaps we're not seeking freedom anymore. Perhaps now we're seeking meaning. Unqualified freedom is no longer the saving message that it once was. And people still need saving. And I don't mean from hell, obviously. I'm a universalist, after all. People need saving from habit from ignorance and from denial, from vapidness and meaninglessness, from consumerism and corporatism, from self-limitation, from difficult history, from bad boundaries and toxic relationships and toxic spirit, from shame and self-loathing, from narcissism, from hate, from despair, from, Bring it on. from fear. 
Our saving message used to be, come here and you can be who you are. And that remains true, but it will not be the saving message for the future. We will need to discover and articulate a new one. That is our work. And this means, by the way, that Unitarian Universalism will not look or feel the same in the future as it has for the last 50 years. But it doesn't look now like it did 100 years ago, right? This is the cornerstone of our tradition, is revision. And if it does look the same in the future as it has for the last 50 years, it will do so until it is irrelevant and incapable. Incapable of saving a life or changing a life or changing the world. It will look different. And that can be a little bit scary, but its foundation will remain. Freedom will always be intrinsic to our tradition. But now the responsibility of interdependence, the ability to respond, the freedom we find in that ability, that will gain in emphasis. Meaning making will gain in emphasis. Our substance will be intact, but our song will change. We are no longer able to sell, so to speak, freedom from. If freedom is to still be our call, we must reorient to freedom with, freedom in. And that reorients our emphasis from freedom in general to meaning, to responsibility, to interdependence. It may be, it may be that freedom was illusory. For 50 years it served us. Perhaps it was a first step. But it was always an exercise in undefining. And now we must orient ourselves to a more positivist paradigm. We must develop, articulate, ritualize, and practice a saving message that includes freedom but emphasizes something else. Responsibility, maybe. Interdependence, those are related. We need something to offer, and it is our work to discover that. This brings us into mutual care, accountability, and concern. If we are going to offer interdependence, if we are going to offer meaning making and responsibility, we are now in the realm of mutual care, accountability, and concern, and our institutional necessities and our theological relevance are beginning to coincide. The future is independent, I mean, I'm sorry, is interdependent, theologically and institutionally. Our cornerstone is revision. And this is our tradition, and that is our future.